from a good storytelling point of view where you really want to grab the audience, I'm not seeing that here because there's absolutely no struggles. There's no overcoming of an obstacle. And frankly, the story becomes very forgettable. Here's the thing. Stories, what it really comes down to is how do you feel at the end? Because we remember how we feel even years later, and we can't remember the details of why we felt it even. We can't remember all the, the words, but we remember how we felt. Hello and welcome to PolyWeb. I'm your host, Sara Landi Tortoli, and my guest today is Corrales Cachola. Corrales is the founder of Brand New Voice, a community of Web3 builders and creators, and he has been consultant for brands such as Intel and Nike. With Corrales, we talk about the most powerful storytelling framework for building a brand and a community on social media. So please enjoy this conversation with Corrales Cachola. Corrales, welcome to Bollyweb. Thank you, Sarah. It's a pleasure to be here. It's my pleasure to have you. And uh, this is really a conversation that I'm looking forward to have uh, because it's a learning experience for me as well. I need to hugely improve uh, on, on my storytelling. So I can't wait to ask you all the questions that are going on in my mind at the moment. <laughs> Well, I am super excited to discuss storytelling with you and Web3. Yeah, actually, maybe Web3 is a good place to start because in our intro conversation that we had last week prior to recording this episode, we, we talk about your concept of uh, Web3 and uh, we ended up talking about it for like over an hour in the end. And I was super fascinated by your concept of the human blockchain. So I think that this sets kind of a nice scenario and then we can deep dive uh, into storytelling. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's a great place to start because it's, it's, it's pure storytelling, right? <laughs> the whole concept of what I call human blockchain. I didn't ever think I would be getting into storytelling as a thing that I do. I'm in marketing and I've always been in marketing and design, web design for most of my career. But when Web3 came, I got into blockchain around 2017, but didn't really go full force until around 20, 2020, 2021, when NFTs really started to, to boom and Bitcoin started to shoot up. And I thought, this is, some, there's something pretty huge going on and I, I want to get back in, in a, I want to get back in, in a, in a different way too, than I was before, which I was before I was just sort of like, you know, trying to find my place and attending a lot of blockchain conferences and, you know, just like a lot of people do when they're new to something. Cause I was learning about all the amazing, you know, things that it could do. But I think when NFTs came, I realized pretty quickly that we're dealing with, these are not like products. They're not, I mean, they, they're, they're, we can call them products, right? I mean, they, I guess in some sense they are depending on their context, but, but I think for the most part, I started to pretty early on call them storytelling devices because to me, it, it didn't make sense in any other context. Like, I, I needed to find something that I could wrap my head around the whole thing, not just, oh, for in this sense, in, in this context, they're this, and, and over here, they're, they're, they're like this. That, that doesn't make sense to me. There, there has to be some fundamental kind of, I guess, anchor in my mind of what they are. And so I started to look at them like storytelling devices because NFT communities you know, that I, I started to, you know, DGN and all these NFT communities and like a lot of people just exploring around and having fun um, and, you know, getting into trading and that kind of stuff. I didn't do too much of that, but, uh, but I, I, I realized like the whole thing is just stories. It's, it's stories of us, you know, and, and that's what I started to, to identify like 
you know, my MF or, you know, PFP, um, it was more than just, you know, a piece of art that I was going to go sell. I, like I would never sell that. It's the one I would, NFT I would never sell because it's like, you know, part of me. And, you know, that might sound weird to a lot of people even still today, but, um, that's how I felt. And that's why a lot, and, and then I met a lot of people that felt the same way. And we used to just er, early on in that community, a lot of us would just sit around going, we don't know what this project is. We don't know where it's going. What are we even doing? But yet we're drawn to it and we couldn't stop thinking about it. And that's the storytelling part that I started to realize is the most powerful force in web three. I mean, you know, we can talk all, all we want about the technical, the implications of Bitcoin and, and, you know, um, opening up new possibilities for people, but all of that begins with stories, you know, the whole, and then I started to apply that thinking to everything in web three, Bitcoin, Ethereum, uh, blockchain. And that's how I started to come up with, you know, human blockchain. So I started to play with like metaphors a lot. Uh, because I felt like it, it became more real when educate web three education became a thing, right? Because in the beginning that wasn't, I mean, no one talked about web three education. We were all just in web three kind of like exploring. And then suddenly at some point there was enough people to go, okay, we need to, people need to get educated. So all these web three education kind of communities popped up. So I was in a few like invisible what was it called invisible friends was that the one yeah Can't remember. probably and, but there there was a number of them i was in like seed club one of the early like seed club just i wasn't a member of i wasn't like one of the seed club like recipients but but i would follow what they did and just started to realize oh, okay now there's web it's a thing like web3 education is a thing it's an actual like industry blooming so then I started to think, what, how do you, how do you even learn this stuff? Like, it's just crazy. It's so fluid. It's so, it's changing all the time. You ask one person and they say something, and you, you ask somebody else, they say another thing. They say, oh no, go do this. And then someone else says, no, no, you, you know, you need to go do this. You should go, you know, understand smart contracts. Oh no, you need to go. What I would do is go read these books or re watch these videos and here's a bunch of resources. And so everyone is doing this and that continues to this day when people ask like, how do I get educated in, in web three? But to me that that's just confusing. It, it's just chaos. Like how can you have any sort of, like, I'm not saying there should be a standard. I'm saying that it's confusing for people. And I, the more people I talk to, the more I realized, especially you know, especially people who would, I would say, have been shut out of web, even web two, a lot of women, a lot of, you know, people of color from, from all over the world. You know, I would start talking to artists. I would talk to all kinds from all, all over the map of web three. And I started to basically interview them and ask them like early on, like, what, what are you struggling with? What do what are you like? What's your thought? Some of them were artists, some of them were like a lot of like people who were trying to break in, but didn't understand what it was all about. And so they would ask me like, so where do I start? And so for a while I would just send resources, but pretty soon again, I realized that's not, I just don't think that's effective. I think what's more effective is through stories. You know, that's how we identify with each other. It's how we learn and inform, not just education, but like passion and, and, and feelings. And that, I mean, to me, that's what true education is about. You know, it has to match with, there has to be an emotional component to it. And so what better way than storytelling to do that? Um, I want to take a step back and go back to your sentence, uh, uh, when you said you were viewing NFTs uh, as a story of us, uh, what, what do you mean by that exactly? I think what I mean is that the NFT can be anything. 
And, and we've seen it done. Like it can be anything. People, you know, people sells an NFT for $69 million. Another person sells it for, you know, $5. So this type of valuation is all over the map, obviously. We knew that early on. And so what, what separates this? There's no, obviously there's no standard. There's no upper limit. There's no standard of these things. What are they? So how can we even have a market around them? Right? It's a very, it's a very crazy situation and it's art, you know? And so what is art, but stories, why does someone have a, you know, a $70 million painting that they bought some rich person from a, from some famous artist, and they, and they, why did they do that? And, and what? What's driving that desire for that? And to me, these are all stories that we tell ourselves. They're, they're all about, you know, if I buy this, I will be part of this maybe community. If I buy this, I will be desired. I will be this. I will be that. I want to become this. You know, and these are just all of consumer behavior can be wrapped up in, in, a, in a form of storytelling. You know, we buy on stories, essentially. And so, but NFTs, I feel like, are, are so potent, so perfectly aligned with storytelling in the sense that when you, when you get an NFT, uh, especially a lot of the PFPs, there's a tendency to immediately take on a persona, you know, as if, you have bonded with this piece of art in a way that's very unique. Like it's just, I've never seen it before, right? It's way different than like a piece of digital art that you would buy in the past. This is completely different. This was like an ownership stake in the project. And then you acquire this, this little P and you put it on your, your, your Twitter, your LinkedIn or whatever. And suddenly you can kind of take on a new persona. At first I thought I must be nuts. I mean, it must just be me. And then I started talking to more people and they said the same thing. They're like, you know, yeah, I, I, I talk different. I, I put out different content. I have different jokes. I have different personas. And depending on which PFP they were putting up, they would take on that's like hardcore storytelling that, you know, this, this is true storytelling. Like I, I'm this, it's, it's, to me, it's no different than a kid who loves Superman or Batman, you know, they, they pretend they're Batman. They go around in a cape of Superman. They go around in a cape They're They feel stronger. Why do they feel stronger? I mean, they're not, are they physically stronger? Well, they could be. Because they're, again, it's like a whole story they're telling. They've bought into a story. And when I was a kid, I liked Superman. When I, and, and I would, you know, go around in this cape that my, my grandma, like, sewed this cape for me. And I thought that was the best thing ever. And I, I have, you know, there's all these pictures when I'm a little kid and I'm in my Superman cape. And my dad was a photographer. And he used to, like, take all these photos of me. and and I, you know, I think back to that, like, that's really what a lot of that NFT movement is about is, is it takes you back to this sort of time of innocence in some ways. And, and it's no different than a lot of comic book stuff, I guess, but it's more, I feel like it's, it's even more powerful because it, it links with your identity and your, and your, even your, your career path. And so I think that's, I think that explains why a lot of People stay in NFTs, even if through the bear market and all through the bad stuff, because they, they're sort of intricately linked with all this environment now with their own identities. What makes uh, a story believable? And perhaps even more, why some stories are more believable than others? Oh, that's a great question. What makes a story believable? Um, I just, uh, just, just came up when you were talking about it. I was yeah. like, this is great. But what makes, like, why were NFTs believable? 
for example, and why among NFTs, mm -hmm. some NFTs projects were more believable than others? I think uh, it's a great question. I've never really thought it, looked, but I, I think I have the answer to it would be, I would say quite simply, a good story has to subvert your reality in a sense. Like you have to buy into a new way of thinking and something, you know, that those are usually the best stories, right? Like you didn't expect it and suddenly you're just, you've gone down the rabbit hole and you hear that a lot in web three. I went down the rabbit hole. And to me, those are stories, just like any story you've been locked into this story. You need to go, you need to explore it. You need to journey. You need to go find out the ending. But of course, with Web3, there's no ending. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's a, it just goes on and it's a, you know, it's a constant journey. It's life, you know? So life is a story. I mean, if you want to get down to it and philosophical, like it, it is, you know, it's a, it's a journey. We're all on these journeys. And then we, we come up with a sense of becoming something else. So that's a story. Like I want to become, you know, a manager. I want to become a CEO. So there's more, those are kind of practical examples, but people do this all the time. And I think yeah. what's really happening is we're telling ourselves the stories. Well, how do, I, what does it take to become a CEO? Oh, well, I have to do, I have to go, you know, I, I want to go get educated here. I want to read these books. I need to network with these people. So, but how do, how do you know that, right? If you've never been a CEO, how do you know what to do? How would you know that path? Right. Like how, how, how is it that you, we just are like, oh, well, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to go talk to this person. I'm going to go take this course. But how do we know that, that that's the path? Yeah. No, we don't. I, I mean, don't. the truth is we don't. But so we tell ourselves a story that says that you, but if you believe it, this is, this is the, I think. You know, getting back to your original question, like what makes a good story? A good story is when you believe it, even if you can't really see it. You don't, you don't, you might not, like you might not know the outcome of it. You might, you might fail. You might, right? But you will go forward anyway. But, but then what is the difference between a story and a belief? Huh? Or is like a, a belief is like a story 2.0 that becomes like set in stone and you cannot distinguish anymore, you know, between fiction and reality. Like, is that one way to see it? I don't think we distinguish between reality and fiction. I don't think we've ever distinguished between them. One example is Wakanda. Okay, there's, you know, the movie uh, Black Panther. and so it's, it's all fictional, but yet after the movie came out, um, there's a lot of even African nationals who t say Wakanda now, and, and they talk in, in a more empowered sense of Africa. And I'm not saying that the movie did all of that, but it unlocked a lot of that sort of, you know, attitude and, and story and you know, then there's Akon who's building a real life Wakanda because I, I don't know if he was inspired by the movie or not, but, but he does use that term. I've heard him say it. I'm building Wakanda. I'm going to help build the Wakanda. I don't remember which country, the Senegal maybe, but it's an amazing, I think that's a really great example of how fiction, reality, they, they're all the same. They, they become the same uh, sci-fi, sci-fi movies. I mean, look at all this sci-fi technology we have that were in movies, not, you know, in TV shows 30, 40 years ago. Like that's not that long ago, uh, 30, 40, maybe 50 years. So you have like Star Trek and, you know, these types of shows and other types of sci-fi uh, books and genres that stories, big stories that led to, that captured the imagination of the young Steve Jobs, the young Jeff Bezos, who then went on to create products and built in those stories, those, the things that they were as a, probably as a boy were wanting to, you know, 
bring into reality. And here they are now very powerful people and, and, and say, oh, I'm going to make, you know, I want to have a talking device just like I saw when I was a boy on that show that I loved or whatever book I read. I think we're beginning to, to now question, see the, the connection between especially science fiction stories and reality, bringing that into reality, AR, VR, XR, extended reality, like all these things, AI, all of this stuff that we're faced with today we have is started. I mean, you, there's so many famous examples from, from sci-fi, you know, that, that talked of this future. I think a lot of people, like a lot of people who don't believe in that will, will say, well, you know, that's ridiculous because we don't have flying cars and they've been predicting flying cars forever. And what a stupid idea that's been. And maybe we'll never have flying cars. Right. So, but the point is, you know, when, when these stories start to work on your mind and then get passed on generation to generation to person, to person, to person, this is, this is the power of storytelling. This is what builds worlds. This is what builds universes. This is what changes the world. Maybe now we're going uh, a little bit off track and uh, <laughs> uh, we can cut it out. But no, I love this definition that you just gave. Uh, and uh, I could, could keep talking about this for hours probably. But what are the most powerful stories uh, that you see right now unfolding around us. Yeah, in Web3? Yeah, in general, just in Web3. I think in, the, in a lot of NFT communities, you're, you're witnessing a new birth of culture. That's definitely happening because it's, it's really, really potent. It's really powerful. And people are almost borders on religion in some of these communities it's that it's that deep it's that serious so when you i think when you see that level of you know and, and and some of this you know to be fair can be sort of scary right this is not all good but let's face it i mean humans are drawn to i mean we're we're, we're literally drawn to stories all over the place stories and desire for something different or right unique desire for this and that so i think this obviously leads to a lot of bad stuff too but the biggest stories in web3 you know nfts are definitely if not number one i mean i mean i think they're number one just as a general grouping category but along with that you have you know things like defi decentralized finance and and you know the ethereum story the bitcoin story uh you know th these are all just legendary web3 stories that get that get reinforced through co through community through culture and you know this this distinction between i mean the fact that we even say there's a web3 and a web2 that, that's another story. Like, there, wh where, where's this line? Like, did someone, like, can we point it out? Like, when do you cross over? Like, well, how do you know you're crossed over into Web3? So technologically speaking, you could say there is a difference between Web2 two, Web two and Web3. But I'm curious on a human storytelling point, uh, what's the difference? I, I think that the difference in the storytelling uh, is when you basically start living and breathing and dreaming in a Web3, I guess, ethos. Web3, at this point, frankly, to me, is much more about thinking frameworks and stories than it is about actual technologies that are doing things. Because, you know, as we can see with a lot of uh, efforts to decentralize things or finance, all these things, you know, the Bitcoin story, they, they're very difficult, obviously, to implement wide scale. So that doesn't, that's not going to come overnight. And 
the technologies are still so new that they're just not ready for wide distribution. I think it's a, we do a disservice to, to the whole web three when we constantly keep harping on all of the tech side, that's just not ready. I mean, one example is like just today, the big news was meta dumped NFTs from Instagram and Facebook. And last year they were all, it was all about, they were going heavy into web three. They've completely dumped it. And so, you know, this gets mixed reactions and, and there's different takes, but I think it's safe to say that web two people in web two, which are largely on Instagram and Facebook and don't care about web three are just don't care about this stuff. I mean, if they did, they would be wanting it, you know, on, on those platforms. It's, it's pretty simple. And so why don't they want it? Because it doesn't mean this, they're not bought into the story, you know? So, so how can we buy into a story? So what are the elements uh, that make up for a good storytelling, something that people mm. believe in? I think you have to get into local communities and you have to, you have to, ju just like anything works, you have to go and build bridges and, and tell the stories out in the communities. This is something that we all have to do. Actually, one of the good things I think that came out of this meta thing saying no more NFTs is that so far people, a lot of people in web three seem to be under the impression that these brands who have all, all these eyeballs are going to bring mass adoption, quote unquote. And that's how, that's the key. So, so we put all this effort into like, oh, Nike is into NFTs now, Adidas, oh my God, it's Starbucks, see this. The future is now it's happening, but that's all a facade because brands, companies, they are stories too. They are, and, and those, and, and those stories are changing. People are starting to change that story and say, you know, I, maybe I don't want to, you know, COVID, COVID happened. And then a lot of globally, you have work from home suddenly that, that became a normal thing. And. So almost all over the world, you see this new, this new shift in thinking, well, maybe I don't, maybe it's not good to go. I don't want to go back five days a week and work eight hours a day. I just don't want to do it. So they're either quitting, they're moving jobs, they're going into web three, they're going into in, in entrepreneur, they're going into creator economy, they're working multiple jobs, but they don't, but people don't want to go back to this old story that that, that was pre-COVID. That's what's interesting is how that's once that story shifts, it's 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 an you you're off on a new thing. And and this is, you know, once these things become accepted globally, they just become the norm. And and so if we get back to web three, I think that's what has to be done to to tell because you have to move culture. You know, like in order for web three to become something that stays, you have to move the culture broadly. You can't just say, oh, we've got this cool technology. We've got this amazing blockchain. We've got Ethereum and it does all this stuff. And it's, the, it's we've got digital money now and it's safer than banks and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, it's, it's, it, you're in, you're in control. That that's generally the story right now. You're in control of your data and your money and your, your future. That's the big story in Web3, which is not true at all, because you can't have that if you haven't moved culture outside of Web3. So you just exist in a bubble if you're believing that. I mean, right? It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't really happen broad. Like you can't go around right now going, traveling around using Ethereum and Bitcoin and, you know, paying your rent and it's not happening. I agree. I agree. But yeah. how do you move this culture, you know, towards, uh, you, how do you nudge it, I guess, towards that direction? Well, that, that's why I say people have to start realizing that we, we have to get into the local communities at a local community. And this, so this has to be a push that any, everyone has to be part of. So you have to take part in building things for people 
that matter that means something to them outside of blockchain and web like it has it should have nothing to do with that what it should have to do with is the again the thinking frameworks because it's much more you, know, you think about it like decentralization which is essentially a kind of like diversity right you could call it diversity in another form and it's much more important to tell that story and to show and then back up that story with proof and the, the only proof we really have is not through like making points online and arguments and this and that and facts and figures that's that's not going to do it it's actually going out and i'm not i'm not saying like in real life you have to do this there's all kinds of ways to do it what i mean is like you could do it online too online community building you can do things but you have to i think you have to produce not just solutions that people want, but you have to, you have to tap into heritage, culture, deep seated human value systems that, that are just at the core of our existence. That's what has to be done because that's how money works. Money, you know, money came after bartering and bartering was a form of like exchange, like, you know, I, I, I'll give you this. Can you do this? Okay. What, what can you, what can you, and then, and, and people started to assign their own value to this. So this was a kind of decentralized thing, right? Bartering. Then after that money came, so money, money can't come first until bartering had to do its thing and seep into the society, society globally. And people had to understand, oh, if I give you this, I get this, or if I give you this, you will do X amount of work for me. So this, so this is how we assign the value. So then money, money comes along it's because now they understood how they can apply these things in a more standard way because they, you know, it's kind of like data collection today. You would, you would, you would collect data on how all this works and, and you have to test, test, test collect data, get feedback, talk to people, have conversations, just like, you know, we're doing now, see what works, what doesn't adjust, launch new things. It's, it's no different than MVPs and all this stuff today. It's just in a different form. We, we just didn't have that technology then, but you're doing the same type of, the philosophy is the same. And, and, and so it means you have to go do meaningful things for people. And then you can come up with the you know, the, the great thing about the technology is we do have blockchain and, and crypto and all these things, NFTs to go along with that, you know, with that meaning that we, we need to bring, but you can't, you can't put that first because it doesn't make sense. How are, that's why it doesn't make sense. If I go out and go to my local store and say, gosh, you know, why don't you guys exchange in Bitcoin around here. I, I really want that to happen. It makes more sense. And right. What would, what would be the reaction? They'd be like, they wouldn't even know what you're talking or most people wouldn't know what you're talking about. And they would just be like, laugh it off because to do that is a complete, I, I suppose it's like, it's an illusion that, that, that you have that somehow something you learned or, you know, is better than what's out there. And so you're just going to go and say, well, I have a better system. I'm going to show you all these things that are so much better than what, what you know, and then expect that to just fly. I mean, it doesn't work like that. Like nothing works like that. Like, so we really have to understand we, you have to build those bridges. And I'm not saying you, you sort of, give up your, your vision for, for web three, or you sacrifice your values in order. No, I'm saying that you have to start, we have to start building unique solutions in web three that apply specifically to web three that can only be done in web three and apply it to people's lives somehow. Mm. So, I mean, what that looks like, it's going to depend on the context. And so that's why I say, it's better to understand specific places, you know, like, you know, this 
thing I'm doing now with called, you know, culture three fund is about looking at specific places like Latin America regions and, and then narrowing it down. What, what is needed in those areas? What, what is, what are the problems going on? So, I mean, Latin America is huge. You can't just say all of Latin America. So now you do have to get down to country level then city level, right? So it's a lot of narrowing down and then understanding what are the, what are the problems? What are the, what are the desires of, of people there? What do they want? What is this group of people? And then to, just to back up a little, I don't think, I don't think you have to take everyone along in web three. I think it's, it's sort of a, you know, we have to understand not everyone is going to come along for the ride and that's okay because you need the leaders to lead, show people what can be done, you know, act as the guinea pigs. That's what I think a lot of us are in the early stages. We're sort of guinea pigs. We're using ourselves as examples for other people to follow. So you can't expect all these other people to just be bought into everything as they watch you crashing up and down and you know, to going going nuts. That's unrealistic. So we have to understand our role in, in, in Web3 is to be that leader. What I like to say is, when you go first, other people follow you. So you have to go first. They're not going to go first. You do. If you have the vision, go first. I think that's what onboarding is about. I love this. Uh... This picture that, that you portray that you, you have to go first, you have to be willing to, you know, set yeah. the example, build those bridges. Uh, um, I want to, to get back to what we were talking about earlier about storytelling. Because the reason why I asked you on the show is because I started following you. Uh, because of the post that you put out on LinkedIn, uh, which I I found very, very thoughtful and very, very uh, thought through, not non-trivial. And I wanted to ask you, what's your process? Uh, what's your creative process, you know, behind writing those posts? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I, I hope a lot of people watch this and because... It's not about me. I mean, sure, it's, you know, we all have an ego. We all want attention on our posts and numbers and, you know, follower count. These are, you know, vanity metrics. But to me, the driver for, for me is always, how is this going to help people in the way that I would like them to? And what, you know, I mean, if people are following you, you have to realize, like, you have to accept the fact that they're following you for a reason. And it's going to be different from a reason they're following maybe other people. So I think it is up, you have a kind of duty and a commitment to say, okay, thank you for your follow. Now, I need to make do on my commitment to you. And what does that commitment mean? It means that you're putting out content that is in alignment with what they, what they desire. But the other part is you in kind of imparting your vision and that, that it's a, it's a combination. I look at it as that. So, but it, it's always about what the audience is going to, how they're going to use that knowledge. That's what drives it. I mean, for me, that's what drives me to do it because otherwise I think then you tend to focus too much on yourself and go, and, you, and that's what causes a lot of paralysis in, in putting stuff out or getting your big vision out there is because people are, you're too concentrated on yourself and you're thinking, well, what if I mess up? What if I say the wrong thing or it's not perfect or whatever? But when you start to focus on your audience, everything changes. So you begin to, you begin to, you know, be less focused on what you're doing and more on them. And then kind of interestingly, I think what happens is you become a better, you simply become a better creator of that content and that your voice becomes stronger. Your vision becomes more clear through them. 
So you kind of, it's a give and take, you know, situation between the audience and you. Do you have a process for which you come up with your, uh, with your content? Like, do you, for example, you know, for, for listeners, do you sit down and draft uh, a weekly content uh, in one day? Do you use any particular tool to help you in your research? Uh, and uh, following up to that, I'm curious to know if, what what you write um, follows a particular structure. Yeah, those are great questions. Um, so a couple of years ago, before I was like in Web3, I guess, I was doing concentrated on bank, small bank marketing, which I still do, but I don't, it's not the, it's not my main content anymore, but it was then, you know, about two, three years ago. And I started to go, Okay, well, if I don't want to do that, what do I want to do like on LinkedIn? I started to apply branding thought process to everything. And that really helped me because you I think it's really important to have frameworks that you start out with. I I don't like if you ask me what do I use today, it's a mishmash of all kinds of different things. But I started with a what's called a brand archetype. Um archetype, archetype, I can't think that's the pronunciation a brand archetype. And these are, are based on Carl Jung's kind of psychology frameworks, mostly about that. I don't think he intended it for brands, but advertisers, I think, I don't know in what, at what point 40, 50 years ago, they started to apply it to advertising and go, oh, these could work well for, for advertising because they started to see that brands are like a lot like people. And, pe and they're treated a lot like people. People look at them like other people. So they, they start to, a brand gives off, exhibits a lot of emotion and things like this. And, and these, so these sort of psychology frameworks that became the brand archetypes are these sort of, I think there's 12 of them. And there's like, you know, the hero, the creator, the like, you know, a lot of people know these things. But I, I wasn't a big fan of this. Like, I thought these are too rigid, like the creator, the hero, the Joker, you know, the, so the Joker brand has a lot of funny stuff in it. The color scheme is a sort of uh, color psychology that aligns with people who like this kind of, you know, humor or whatever. But what I did is I started combining them. So I combined like a creator persona with I think it was the creator and the hero. I think that's what I did. And I just, I combined them together and I, I came up with a color palette based on that. I came up with a voice and, but more, more importantly, I came up with what would become my focus on community because I started to, because when you look at these brand archetypes, you see that like, let's say the, the, the creator, the creator brand is kind of like Apple. So Apple is in that creator category. And so you start to look at like, what are kind of Apple's typical audience? You know, what do they, so these frameworks kind of help inform you to go, oh, like the app, people who follow Apple are influenced by a lot of creativity process and that you know, they're different, they think different and that kind of thing. And so you can start to form, it, it makes it easier to, to form your, your content strategy around that, that stuff. And so for me, it became this aha moment in studying those frameworks was like, I want to be a community guy. And so I started to basically structure all my content that the whole purpose was to build a community. So I would like, I, I came up with this thing called Yo LinkedIn Raps. And I would go and if I wanted to like get on the radar of, of another creator that I liked, I would take their post and rap about it. And I would video myself and do this rap song on it, like making all this stuff up. It's just goofy stuff. But 
but it was really like, those were my early experiments with, can this actually work? My vision now was becoming more clear. Like I wanted to create, to build community. I wanted to help empower people at any cost. That, that's just what I started to think. So the more I thought like that, the more innovative my content became. So I was doing things that other people weren't because a lot of people were too stuck on, you know, this sort of, how do I come up with content ideas? But when you, when you have a vision of yourself, of, of like what you want to become. So I knew I, I want to become this community guy. I don't know what that exactly looks like, but all I want to do, I'm going to make it real simple. And I just want to create content that helps build community. I don't, I didn't even have a plan. Like what, what was I going to do with all these people? I didn't even think that far ahead. I just had this vision that I, it made me, frankly, it just made me feel good to concentrate on other people's wins than mine. Because for me, if I did that, like turn that inward, I would get anxious and go, oh my God, like people are watching me. So I decided, why would I focus on myself? It's not helping my, my content efforts. It's not helping me get followers. So why don't I just go and, you know, help other people. And, and so that's kind of what I started doing. And, and that became my, my lead in into web three which is my current kind of framing too. Is there a formula that it's proven uh, works uh, for effective storytelling? And I wonder if you maybe have some examples uh, at hand of, uh, you know, this formula. Maybe we can yeah. show um, listeners uh, and uh, for people uh, that instead are watching on YouTube, uh, we'll, uh, we'll show exactly what you're looking at, but maybe we can give some examples uh, of uh, what is a good framework for storytelling versus uh, a bad framework or, or a framework yeah. at least that needs, that needs improvement. Okay. <laughs> I like the way you put it. In, in need of improvement. In need of improvement. <laughs> um, Yes, that's, that's great. I do have some great examples. Um, so let me, I'm going to share my screen. And for people who are listening instead, uh, um, via podcast, uh, we're going to read, you know, maybe you could read aloud what you're, you're seeing yeah. so that also listeners can follow. So I'm going to start out with what I call personal narrative and specifically for, for any listeners, I like to actually call them founder narratives because it, it seems to resonate better with people. So a good example of a, a founder personal narrative is Justin Welsh, who a lot of people know and follow. He's a big time, uh, big time creator and he has this great framework I saw in his newsletter that he calls the founder story and I condensed it, but the basics of this thing is actually pretty simple. And if you, if you just follow this framework, you can come up with your own and that's the, that's, and these are very powerful because if you see this is, he put this, this out four years ago and I mean, he's got 14,000 light reactions. 816 comments, 450 reposts, which is off the charts. I mean, the guy is, he was big then, but that's just insane. That's literally insane. And if you read this at the bottom, this took off and I have 1,100 unread messages in my inbox. Very unexpected. I am humbled, wildly appreciative. Feel free to sign up to get this type of stuff from his website. So if you look at this, What's interesting, even though he's a, he was a big creator then, but he wasn't as big as he is now. This was four years ago. This is all on one post. And this is the power of stories, of, of, a, good, of a good story. Because what he, what he effectively did, Justin, I, I, don't, I didn't follow him four years ago, but I know he's a legend. You know, He's one of these legendary creators, and he had a big audience then. Um, but 
I don't, I'm going to, I'm just going to take a wild guess here. I bet he didn't put out a personal narrative yet. I think this was the first time and that's why he's so surprised. Um, and the reason it's interesting is because all he did was tell his story, but he did something that what all good stories have, which is struggle and obstacles. And then, so that's, that's what I highlighted in, in red obstacles and struggles. You know, I got fired three times before I was 28. I never hit quota in my first four years of sales jobs. I, at 28, I took a job as one of the first salespeople at a tech company in New York city. So these are, these are the struggles. And then there's this, look at how simple this is. It, it's called the, he calls it a change event in, in a lot of storytelling, they call it the inciting moment, I believe. So the inciting moment is this like cl point of clarity that people reach and everything changes after that. So he calls it a change event. And the change event for him was something funny happened, an intersection, I'll call it the intersection of finding a product team culture and city I loved, which happened to be New York city. So that that's it. After he tells that this change event, he goes into the results. Now he's going to show sort of proof of what happens. And this is where people get by the end of this result. That's what causes people to go literally lose their, cause sometimes they'll lose their mind wrapped up in this story. So the result was he got energized, pumped every day, worked nonstop. You know, I won every award possible. I got promoted five times. He's obviously leaving out a lot of, you know, nuance and things that happened, you know, in between, but that's, that's how it works. You can't, in a good, it has to be short and short, you know, punchy to, to have the effect. So he's just having the highlights. I became an executive. And then what he does, an, another fundamental element is you need a, you need high emotion. You need to drive something really hard at the end. And that's what he does here at the end, which I, I didn't highlight, but he says, you know, he, he kind of wraps it up, but when they all intersect. And so he's bringing that back up to this change event, which was the, he calls it intersection. So he does a good job of looping that back at the end. And then these are the two lines that I really like. That's when you get dangerous. You forget the old you have. And this, this is the stuff that just people like you have no idea how powerful this stuff is. If, if you've laid this out correctly, one line like that at the end is just crazy. It, it is very, very powerful because people, they want to feel and they want to be impacted really hard by something. And that's what he's done here. And then what I like about this last line is it's a good demonstration of he's passing on the story. He, it's not just him, right? He's, he, if he ended it here, it would still be pretty powerful, but he goes a step further and he says, have fun out there today. Go find the new you. And this is what is really, really critical in storytelling. You need to, you need to pass the baton. Your whole goal in this is to empower people through your story, not to just brag about what you've done. You know, he could have just said that, like he could have just said, I won every award and, you know, da, 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 and just stop there. And a lot of people frankly do that. They just go on and on and on about things that they've done. And, and, and are, are these stories? Sure. Are they effective stories? No. Because a, a good story is like this. It's this stuff at the end that brings it home, emotion, and then empowerment. So my understanding, uh, if you want to become a good storyteller, is that you have to get comfortable at getting uncomfortable, meaning uh, sharing uh, things about yourself that make you vulnerable. So that's step number one. Then you need to yeah. think through change events or like the mm -hmm. significant moment that got you to, to change somehow. Right. Right. And then at the end, you need to share a powerful result, like what happened after that change. And that what happened needs to be something big and magical. But what I'm thinking is uh, 
okay, that, that might work for one story or two story, right? Uh, but mm. you can't be extraordinary at everything. You no. know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So some people will say that too and say, that's partly why I think storytelling gets a bad, a bad rap because they, a lot of people think, well, you're just making stuff up and kind of making these big, unrealistic, emotional things to pump people up because you want to produce a result. And that's true to an extent, but you don't have to. It, it, it really, I would say it depends on your personality and your brand. Because there are other, other stories that, you know, I, I, I did say something powerful. Well, that's Justin Welsh, but that's just what he wanted to elicit. But there's other, you know, you could tell a story if you were an insurance salesman and you wanted to tell a story of that you overcame this obstacle and that now you, you understand that after that event and it, Maybe it affected your family or something like that, or it affected your personal health. And you don't want to do that anymore. You, your mission is now to go help people understand that, that insurance is about taking care of other people, right? So that, it doesn't have to be this massive, like, you know, huge thing. You know, I, I traveled around the world and then I did this and that, you know, it's, it is important to keep to your values. Some people do extend their story out. They, they stretch it. And that's okay. It's story, you know, it's, again, you have to understand your audience. I guess back to back up, it's a combination of you and your kind of vision and the audience. So in, in his case, in Justin Welsh's case, the audience, he knows the audience well enough at this point. They're kind of like craving this, to hear this line from him. He kind of knows it. He know he almost knows what to put. You know, at this point, he's done a lot of content. He's put out. He's gotten feedback. He kind of knows his followers, so he's going to put in a line like that. That because that's his follower graph. Th those things align with their values. Their their that's what is going to empower them. So he, as the creator, will do what it takes to empower them. So you know, it's important to understand that it's not just a a blanket cookie cutter thing where you just say like, be vul you know, you have to get super vulnerable. You have to have this massive story. No, you have to have a, a story that is true to you, that you feel in your bones and that aligns with your values so that you're not giving up things that, you know, that are uncomfortable, you know, don't do that. Don't give up the stuff that you feel uncomfortable about <laughs> talking about, but but do have the courage to put out things that, yeah, maybe it makes you feel a little uncomfortable. That's okay. That's a, I think that's a good thing for most people to get a little bit uncomfortable. That's when you know you're on the right track. But if you don't feel like doing that, that's okay. You can still produce the result. But again, you, you need to understand your audience. Because if he told this to an audience that was not really feeling that vibe that he's putting out, I mean, it, it would still probably go big, but not as big as it did, right? Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Oh, now you got me thinking. <laughs> so I'm not the best at sharing personal things. So now you got me thinking. I'm like, yeah, oh, it, I think I should share a bit more. <laughs> you know, and it, it's okay because I've, I've heard that a lot. Like, that's why I say it because everyone has a good story like to tell. And I think it's important to tell that can help people. So I would rather see a story that maybe is not as huge of a narrative versus I would rather see that than someone just say like, I'm not going to do it because I don't like sharing personal stuff, right? Because you don't have to share a lot of, you know, uncomfortable details about your past that you don't want to share. And, yeah. and again, and it, uh, another thing that uh, Justin points out in the, his blog about this is that he says, he, he actually gives examples of like podcasts that he was on where he changes the story a little bit. So if you look here, he has this method, the obstacle, the internal struggle, the change event, the result, 
But I sort of pared that down. If you if you read his his full mm-hmm. post, he's got other stuff in there like the guide. Well, the guide is you know in storytelling is like this person who you meet along the way who helps you. So this is in a lot of you know movies and TV shows. You know, you're this person that is the wise. So this is fr- pretty typical too in a lot of personal narrative. They talk about then I met you know Joe who who really helped me understand how to do something. So that becomes part of their story. So he, he has another story where it's like this, but he inserts this other thing about the guide. And so he, he might tell that on a podcast. So he's always looking at who's the listener base. So if I, so if he goes on to say, let's say he goes on to a B2B podcast and there's a lot of kind of business people who have a boss, he might use, it might be a smart thing for him to use that guide in there because he knows those people will, will resonate better with a story that there's a person that helped him. So they, because in their world, like if he tells this story without that guide to those people who are B2B and are working at a nine to five, it might not hit as hard because they'll be like, Good, that's cool. But I mean, I like it, but I don't live in that world. I, I, w- I wish I could, I'm not an entrepreneur like, like okay. you or you. so he, he knows he's smart where he, he'll, he'll say, oh, I'm going to insert this guide into this pot when I talk on this podcast or I talk on this interview and then it's going to resonate and it can, and it could be as simple as this one little line that he puts in and says, and, and he might even change the ending and say, you know, if it weren't for that guide, I don't know where I'd be today. Uh, cause that guy really helped me understand my, my change event or whatever. And I really owe it to him. And, you know, in your, in your line of work, who is, who's someone who has inspired you, you know, and that's, that's a good way to use the story and then produce an action. Okay, cool. So I guess in this, uh, in this episode, you are definitely the guide because you're inspiring all of us to produce better <laughs> stories. Thank you. But, Thank you. Yeah. Okay. This is an example of a good story. Uh, and yeah. we got the main elements and maybe we can instead look at one that it's not so good so that okay. we kind of see the comparison, like the bad one. Yeah. So this is an example indeed. I, I, and by the way, I love indeed. <laughs> I've learned a lot from indeed website about mission, vision values. So I've actually used them as an example in a course I, I teach called human marketing. And I've used a few of their, their things, so I don't want to pick on them, but this, I, I think it's, imp- I, I wanted to show this because this is t- what a lot of people call personal narrative. And I've seen actually a lot of educators use this framework that, that indeed is talking about here. And I, you know, again, I, I'm not pick. this may work for some people. I, I don't know, but all I know is that. The, the examples are good to show as a contrast to what I just showed. And because there's something fundamental missing in these examples and it's conflict, it's struggle, you know, and, and a, a good story has that struggle. It tells you the, of how you overcame something. Here's an example of a, of what they call a personal narrative. This is for a college application essay. You know, many students write personal narratives to accompany their college applications. Example, I always dreamed of working in my family's business. Growing up, I always pictured myself working as an accountant, diligently helping people arrange their finances and file their taxes, just like I saw my parents do for years. It never occurred to me I could do, I could choose my own career path until I took a volunteering tutoring position in high school. As I began helping young students reach their learning objectives, I realized teaching could give me something accounting couldn't, and that's fulfillment. So, you know, it's nice. There's nothing wrong. Like, it's a story. Like, you can't, we can't disqualify people's stories. I can't say that's a bad story or that doesn't, you shouldn't tell that story. What, all I'm, all I'm saying though is check out, 
look, look at some of the structure of some of these. To me, again, this may work. I don't know if, if this works for a college application. Maybe it does. You know, it, it is in their career guide. All I know is that from a, from a good storytelling point of view where you really want to grab the audience, I'm not seeing that here because there's absolutely no struggles. There's no overcoming of an obstacle. It's just about this person dreamed of working in the family business. And frankly, those become very forgettable. The story becomes very forgettable. Here's the thing. Stories really, I think what it really comes down to is how do you feel at the end? Because we remember how we feel even years later. And we can't remember the details of why we felt it even. We can't remember all the, the words or the thing, but we remember how we feel, we feel. And that is what you see in a good personal narrative like Justin Welsh's. There's these certain lines that you might not even remember the lines, but there's something like little snapshots in your head might pop up years later where like, he's like, you know, would, you'll, you'll be dangerous. Like that's, that's a very emotional, hard hitting thing. And with the right audience, they will literally remember this for years. That one little thing, they might not remember the rest of his narrative, but now that's so think about how effective that is. They're associating that, that memory, that, that energy, the emotion with that person who said it, which is going to be mm -hmm. him. And they don't even remember all, because so, you got to think people are reading content all day. They're reading this, they're learning this. What are the chances that they're going to remember you in a year? So if I, if I look at this, is this really going to stick in my mind a year later of this person talking about their family business and they dreamed of being an accountant and then I, I don't, I, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say it's going to be very forgettable. Again, may, maybe this works just for the purpose of a college application essay. I, I don't know. But, but there's a number of them. There's another one, um, a no, creative writing. of They signed up for a nonprofit. A week later, they were uh, they're being a train headed to my first stop. I spent two months interacting with the public. I don't think I could have in academic only setting. I continued this trip for the next eight months. I finally returned home, prepared to begin my medical school career. The end, you know. While you're talking, like there is one thing that pops up in my mind is that when we're going through a, a tough period or life uh, is uh, being hard on us, uh, well, maybe we should be grateful. We will have better stories to tell, you know, like, <laughs> You can see yeah. the positive of this. Yeah, it's, it's really, I think it's really important. If you want that connection with people, you have to give up some, some of your secrets. You know, they, 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 they want to know those vulnerabilities, like we talked about earlier, and that helps them. So if, if that's what helps them, it becomes now a little bit easier for you to say, you know what, I'll, I think I'm okay with talking about some of these vulnerabilities because I know there is a outcome that's going to help people with it. So okay. it's, it's, it's worth it, right? Is that, I mean, that, that's the question. Is it worth it to you? If the answer is no, then maybe that some of those vulnerabilities are too raw, which would, I would say, yeah, don't, don't say something that's so raw. It's going to hurt you or put you in a bad spot. No, don't do that. But I, I like to call it scar tissue. Talk about the, you know, we all have scar tissue and we carry these, we have scars and we have scar tissue and then we have some open wounds. Mm -hmm. Now the open wounds, I think that's what you see a lot of on a lot of influencers on like Instagram. There's a lot of drama, right? And they're talking about their open wounds, a breakup that just happened something open and raw and this mm -hmm. obviously gets tons of people watching and that's maybe that's i guess that's what they want but to me it's a, that's a very toxic form of storytelling that 
when you invite that type of stuff, you are also, you better be careful with it because the kind of people that are going to start coming into that, your circle are going to be the ones wanting more and more drama, high drama and, and okay. a toxic storytelling. And that's what I would say Fair a lot point. of, a lot of influencers get into that type of storytelling and, and sure. And it works for them, no doubt. Uh, but the question is, do you want that kind of attention? If the answer is yes, then, you know, what, who am I to say, right? <laughs> like, it's your story. You could tell it however you want, right? Fair point. Absolutely. Is this the only framework for good storytelling, right? Like, let's say, for example, you want to write a post uh, regarding uh, what is Web3. Do you need to get personal with that? Like, tell your journey in this space? Or could you do something more, let's say, informational? That's so what I'm asking is, are there other frameworks uh, that are effective uh, uh, besides the one uh, that, that you just showed? So, in this example, um, this is a, a, similar, a similar framework to Justin Welsh's where it's a personal narrative. This was a, from a, a Facebook group and she's a, she's a really mm. big content, uh, a writer on, on, on medium. And she has a lot of cool courses and her, the Facebook group is actually really good. So I'm just going to, I'm going to start at the end because I want, I wanted to show how, what she's doing here. So. It, it's important also, like in storytelling, in, in business storytelling, um, especially, you want to have an objective. You know, Justin Welsh, his objective on that was probably simply to, you know, it, it was just to produce a big, probably share, like he wanted it to go viral. And, and so that, that's an objective. And this, uh, this is more specific, though. She wants, people to sign up for her class. So this is more of a, you know, direct funneling of the customer. This is, this is direct acquisition of a customer through, uh, through her, her narrative. And so that, that's the ending. So I'll skip back to the beginning and show what she did. She, she does the same stuff. When I started to write, you know, here, here's the struggle part. This is the struggle that she's going to outline. When I started to write in 2018, I thought it's too late. Whenever I, whenever I felt stuck or didn't see the results I expected, I told myself it's because I'm too late. So here she's, she's producing a theme too late. I'm too late. Cause she knows again, she keeps her audience in mind. Yes, it happened to her, but she's also probably putting a little bit more into it. Because she knows the audience has this pain point that she, she might even be, have been told directly by a, a number of them, I feel like I'm too late to do this stuff. So she, of course, when she tells her story, she's going to inject this same language from her audience that they tell themselves to get over that, you know, to solve that problem. She's problem solving for them right away. So she, it's too late. This is the theme too late. I tried to comfort myself by believing it's not my fault. But at some point I was sick of looking for excuses. I wanted to, I wanted results. So this is what, if you go back to the Justin Welsh example, this is sort of the change event. She's starting to, she's starting to get into it. I wanted results. I wanted to write for a living. I wanted to share my stories and I wanted to get paid for doing what I love so I could live life to the fullest. So that's not the change event yet. Now the change event happens. After two years of excuses, distractions, and fear, I decided to go all in. Here's the, here's the action that she actually does so that you can kind of emulate her if you want. I started to write daily and spent hundreds of hours studying the ins and outs of successful online writing. Within less than six months, I reached a million readers. By the end of the first year, I made almost six figures in profit. Today, I'm one of the 
Medium's most read writers. I'm sending newsletters of 30,000 subscribers and I'm running a community with 10,000 writers. She's packaging the result, everything in here, like the change event and the results happen in this, this slide. And then she kind of brings it back to the beginning. And it all started with the burning desire to try something new. If I had listened to those saying, it's too late, I'd probably be stuck in a job I hate right now. And then just like Justin Welsh, she empowers you. The same is true for you. You know, you can do it. Don't let anything stop you. It's not too late. So she presses on that point. And that's her main theme. Not too late. You're just on time. So it's a nice way to end it, like reframe your thinking that you're not too late. It's perfect. You're on time, actually. Don't think you're too late. Think you're on time. So now she's, she's earlier we talked about, like you asked, what, what's a good story? A good story subverts your, your understanding of, of a situation. That's what really hooks you because most people, they go on thinking, I'm too late. I'm too late all the time. Oh my God, I'm too late. She knows that. She knows that her audience says that to themselves. Now she switches their whole reality in this one line. At the end, she says, no, 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 reframe this. You're just on time. But it's important to understand, she does that at the very end. She can't do that at the beginning because she hasn't told the story. By the end, she's laid it all out and, and presented it nicely and then flips it on you at the end and you're just like, okay, I'm on time. So now... Now she's going to present her offer because at this point, so she, she's actually playing with brain chemicals, the, the brain, the, the power of that, like ups and downs, the struggle is that you have actual brain chemicals that will bring you down. And, and it's like, oh my God, like, okay. And then, and then she brings you up then she brings you down. Steve Jobs used to do this famously in all his, like, if you watch presentations that Jobs did. He would, he would tell you like, and you know, now we're about to introduce something, but first let me tell you about the crappy devices out there. They're all crap. And everyone's like, Ugh. and then he's like, but we have a solution. And then whoop, and you're up, down, up, down. And, and that's what, yeah, and, and this appears in Pixar films. This appears in movies, TV shows. It's all this playing with your chemicals. So she's doing the same thing. And. She, I like the way she does it at the end. It's just this really simple thing. And she's brought you up a couple times and down. And then by the end, you're, she wants you to leave on a high. Like she's re reframed your whole thinking. Oh no, I'm just on time. Now she presents her offer. So do we know how much that increased her offer? Who knows? But, the, but that's the way to do it though. I mean, now... Here she goes. Now she puts out all the details. Here's how you do it. Here's in, on Monday, I'm kicking off this writing challenge, how to confidently, she's using specific words now, confidently grow your audience because she knows she's addressing all those pain points. So you're sitting there going, wow, like, my God, I think I need this thing because I, because you're, you've left, she's left you on this sort of surprise high. You didn't realize this at the end. Oh my God, I'm just on time. Well, where do I sign up? And, and then she puts the registration link and then she puts in a, a little, you know, quote from James Clear about being where she, she probably got inspired by this. So this is another thing. You, you can take someone like James Clear, look at his content, find a story that, that you can form around that and adapt it just like she did. I'm sure that that's what she's doing here. Right. So it's a beautiful like example of how to attach like a strong story with struggle and, and, and overcoming the struggle to an offer and attach it to something that you can, you know, monetize, basically monetize your story. I see. I see. Interesting. Does this, this is very much a personal framework. Right. Does this work also for brands? How do you do it differently in case you are a brand? Like, for example, how do you do it yeah. for your own clients? Let's say, like you mentioned that you used to work a lot with banks before. So 
uh, and somehow I can imagine Bank say oh, at the beginning uh, it was tough. You know, we didn't have many, yeah. you know, many people depositing money, and you know, or uh, we right. were, you know, borrowing uh, too much, and then we went insolvent. But you know, <laughs> like, yeah. which yeah. oh, uh, it's yes. fascinating. <laughs> It's happening right now. It's happening right now. Yeah, see, <laughs> I mean, and, that was tough. And you'll notice that. No, and that's a good example of where you can you can constantly tell these personal narratives because people do it all the time. Honestly, on you see it all over Twitter and LinkedIn. They may not be aware they're telling this personal narrative, but they'll say stuff like, you know, like let's say that this whole, yeah, you know, SV uh, Silicon Valley Bank thing. They want to. They want to make it known that they have some kind of. They have some advice to share that you should listen to because they happen to work in banking, so they may not have even talked about banking. But suddenly, they're they're saying, they're they're gonna and guess what they're gonna do? They're gonna tell a story. So you know when I was, you know, lot, not a lot of people know this, but I worked in in banks like that for for many years, and I saw a lot of this stuff. Right. So they'll start telling these just off the, like they're all, people are always storytelling. We just don't, we just don't realize it. And when you start to notice it, you'll see people doing it constantly on Twitter or whatever. Like they'll just launch these stories because they want it to be, they want to tell that story that, Hey, you should know I actually worked in that environment. I know. And now I'm going to wrap that into my, my argument about Bitcoin. You know, that we should go into Bitcoin. And believe me, I've seen all this stuff. So now you're you're going to pay attention a lot more to them than somebody who is just talking about Bitcoin and how amazing it is and how it's better than banks. That he actually has, you know, uh, this person has, you know, knowledge in this area that not a lot of people do. So, I, I guess to your question about about work doing it from a personal standpoint or a brand. I mean, I, th I think they definitely work more powerfully from a personal level when you can, when you can connect with people, but there's other examples of, so there's a lot of famous advertising. That's basically brand storytelling, like Nike, Apple, you know, they, they tell the story of the customer, the customer pains and the dreams. So you'll see these all, all the time. Uh, you know, Nike will put out some ad about, you know, anyone can be an athlete and they'll tell this story. So that's a, obviously a brand storytelling thing. They're always tapping into the customer mindset and dreams and pains. They, they want to dig into your pains. You know, they want to dig into like your fears and then they're going to present a solution that says, you can overcome the fears by being part of the Nike team or whatever, or by an Apple computer, right? So that's the, I guess that would be the difference between a brand saying it and a, and a person at the brand oh. telling the story. Okay. Interesting. Corellis, this has been an amazing conversation. Before we wrap up, I would like to ask uh, one final question. Uh, and maybe this is for listeners that um, are just starting out, you know, they want to start creating more content, uh, but they still have to find their audience. Uh, they, they don't exactly mm -hmm. know where to start. Who are they talking to? What will be your advice? for for those people yeah it's a, a really important thing sarah like i i think you can start with a couple ways you can going back to that brand archetype you can start there because that will start to show you the type of audience that is going to be drawn to this kind of brand that you you want to build you can start with what's called a a ideal ideal customer persona, there's different names, ideal buyer persona, ICP, which is, I think, ideal customer persona, ideal customer profile, I think it stands for actually. So ICP, so, but any of these personas, per, buyer personas, basically, 
you can start there. And, and so this, what, what that is, is it just, it, it, it allows you to, to have a fictional character of what this ideal person is that you would like to have as your ideal audience that's going to, you know, buy your products and services. So this takes a little research. I mean, but generally people do know, like one, one easy way is going back into your client work or your, your career even and going, who was one person that I worked with that I really enjoyed and why did I like it work? I like, could I work with that type of person again and again and again? If the answer is yes, that be, use that to start out with that as your, your ideal person and, and literally visualize them. You can even use their name. You can, you should use a sort of like, I'm building this for, you know, Suzanne. And in your mind, you're thinking Suzanne, who I worked with all those years ago, I just would love to work with her again. And she has all the qualities that I would just, I would just be so happy. So if you do that, what, what you're doing is basically creating a template that is going to attract more people like her, more Suzannes that share her qualities, her values. So it's important in these personas to understand it's more about attracting their values than their, like what they did for work, you know? So it, it, the persona will tell you things like, you know, she was, she, she really enjoys ballet. She gets into a lot of helpful causes, charity work. If you then begin to align your brand with those things and, and you start talking that in that voice about charity, you're going to, you're going to attract more people like her that share those qualities. So, so sometimes it's just literally a matter of going back into your past and going, who would I like to work with? and have a lot more of them. Corrales, this has been fantastic. Um, as a result of this conversation, I have uh, at least 10 more questions that I would like to ask you. But that, that means that maybe, uh, you know, at one point in the near future, we do a round two of this conversation. Okay. And, uh, I would love to. And we answer some, some unanswered questions. Uh, okay. But, yeah. In the meantime, uh, really, uh, thank you for for being so generous and for sharing your your knowledge uh, we with me and the audience. Uh, it it has been fantastic. Well, thank you, Sarah. It's a, what a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. And uh, for for our listeners, uh, thank you very much for following and. See you at the next episode. Bye. Okay. Cheers. That's all from today's episode. Thank you so much for watching or listening. If you find this episode valuable, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel or to the Polyweb podcast on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. It will be fantastic if you could leave us a rating, a review, or a comment, as this really helps other listeners find the show. All the resources mentioned in this episode will be linked in the description and in the show notes. See you on the next episode. And if you cannot wait until next week, you can watch this episode right here that relates to some of the things that we talk about in this episode. Bye.